Hi everyone, Teddy Baldessar here. And today we're gonna to be doing another Q&A video where I'm gonna be answering some of your questions. I posed a question on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, asked you guys to ask me some questions and today I'm gonna to be answering some of those. Also, if you wanna stay in the loop about when we do Q&As and you wanna take part in future questions, I'd recommend following us on Instagram, Twitter, and also on Facebook. Now, before we jump in, there's been some great new releases on teddybaldessar.com. Just to call out some of those, a new Marathon Navigator. This is a long-standing model within the collection, but this now is coming in full stainless steel. Comes with a screw down crown, an updated bezel, and featuring 100 meters of water resistance, a substantial upgrade from the original version. They did an amazing job with this piece. In addition, if you want a great change of pace, but also to the pilot watch genre, we have the Oris Pro Pilot X Kermit. This watch comes with a striking green dial, but really what makes this one special is the date wheel with Kermit's face set against a darker shade of green popping into view on the first of every month. And then also we have the new Chemende Tural collection now available at 39 millimeters and getting some updated design to go along with it. New handset, new dial layout, these look absolutely fantastic. New variety of dial colors to choose from. And I think our new leaders in the world of dress watches under $1,000 from a Swiss watchmaking perspective. Definitely check out all these new releases and a lot more on teddybaldasar.com. Link will be in the description down below. For our first question here, it comes from Juan. So Juan is asking from Twitter, what are behind the tactics of Rolex's business strategy? Could there be an end game to bolster Tudor? Do you foresee any unintended consequences of their tactics? I've purchased JLC and Breguet. Rolex may drive consumers to other brands permanently. So this is a great question by Juan here and to really get into Rolex's business strategy, I think nobody knows complete what their business strategy is. I do have a video talking about this, the supply and demand side of watches. Uh, I have a video that I can link to that in the description that goes into even more detail than I can provide here, but uh, this asks even further beyond that. But one thing you have to mention when looking at Rolex's business strategy is it's working clearly. They're bigger than they've ever been. They're about 30% of the total Swiss watchmaking industry as a whole. So that is substantial numbers. I think I threw out the numbers in the past, how they are bigger than say like Apple market share or like Samsung. It's like, it's crazy stuff. Like they're absolutely dominating in terms of the sector of watch collecting. But getting into some of the questions you also asked, you talked about Tudor. Now, Tudor, of course, is a brand that I think they're thinking about, but to say that that is the thing that they're you know, really going down and trying to make sure that Tudor's in a good position, like Rolex cares about ultimately Rolex because that's what brings in the money and allows them to operate how they operate. Tudor is a small fraction of the sum of the Rolex organization. And ultimately what their strategy is, and I, again, would recommend checking out that full video down below because I'll be able to go into more details there than I will here, is really just maintaining prestige of the brand and really thinking about this, not from a one-year window, even a five-year window, or really even a 10-year window. Rolex thinks about their organization in century-long timeframes. That was something that I was told when getting into this industry, recognize how Rolex is positioning themselves. They don't care about short-term benefit. They care about building in the long-term, not overproducing, staying true to the path, and maintaining that high demand in the marketplace. They don't wanna make any abrupt changes. They're the ultimate conservative brand in the world of watches next to like a Patek Philippe as an example. So pricing stability and maintaining brand prestige are the utmost importance. I think also that is why they started to dive into the pre-owned section because they didn't have the same ability to have stability in the pricing market. So having that opportunity to then set the certified pre-owned price allows them to have a fixed point where all the other dealers can look at and always have to be cognizant of. But then you ask the question of, do you foresee any unintended consequences of their tactics? And I think even Rolex would agree that there is a give and take with how they've set up their business model. Because of how the ADs are set up, because of how they're deciding to produce watches, that is going to lead to a lot of consumers just frankly, just being pissed off. I think many people that want a Rolex understand it's a product that is highly desirable. There's many people that want it and you have to wait sometimes. But there is a point when luxury items can try to be so exclusive that they cannibalize the total concept of what a luxury experience should be. And Rolex is 
kind of walking that dangerous line and they're going to make some consumers mad. And I think they have. Whenever I talk about Rolex on this channel, it's always like a 50-50 split. It's a controversial type of brand now. It's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, I love Rolex. I think they produce some of the best watches in the world in terms of where they sit in the market. Are they like, you know, high horology types of watchmaking? No, but for what they're good at, they're exceptional at it. But good question, Juan. I would recommend just checking out that video as well because uh, I don't want to get too involved in this. This is the topic I'm kind of passionate about, but uh, I'll let that video do more of the talking. Next question comes from Twitter as well. How do you see Cartier as a watch brand? Even though they have indisputable heritage in watchmaking, do you think the brand in terms of watchmaking is not as strong as other traditional companies like Seiko, Tissot, et cetera, due to its fashion jewelry core? So a little strange brands to be comparing Cartier to, but this is what I'll say about Cartier. Cartier is unlike any other brand in the world of watchmaking. Yes, they're a jewelry brand, but they also have remarkable history in the world of watches. Alberto Santos Dumont in the early 20th century, you know, many would argue maybe being one of the first wristwatches ever, the first pilot watch, there's a lot to kind of get lost in with this brand. 1918, the Cartier tank comes out. It's an absolute icon of the Art Deco era and throughout the 20th century, and even to this day, it's still a leading pillar in the world of fashion and style. Cartier also was focusing on high complications for quite some time. They really were and still are focused on watchmaking in many aspects. But I think the big thing that makes Cartier so unique is that they are also just huge in terms of a company and a brand. You're talking about number two behind Rolex in some of the sales data and turnover. And then beyond that, they're a multifaceted luxury house. They're not just about looking at watches. Like that is a small f segment of what they're all about. But when many brands go that route in the world of watches and they try to be everything for everyone, some of the more traditional buyers are having issues with identifying with the brand. But Cartier has been able to not have those issues the same way. I think they're almost beloved by collectors in the world of watchmaking, uh, including myself. And I hope to do more Cartier coverage this year and uh, have some good plans on that to do so. Next question asks, your recommendation when dealing with $1,500 watches and $700 automatic watches, looking at that range, is there any recommendation on how often or should you send a watch to be serviced? Hamilton Jazzmaster, Seiko Alpinist, or do you simply wear them until they stop working and you take them to a shop? Servicing is an area of watch collecting not many people talk about. Generally, when you're looking at servicing intervals, most brands quote ranges of like five to 10 years on average. That's usually where I see most. When it comes to this price range, not to say that I operate completely differently, but I kind of do slightly, just because I know that many of the movements in this tier are very proven, they're tested, and also the servicing costs are not as expensive. Now, from a ratio standpoint, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it's still a good percentage of the total worth of the watch that you're paying for for some of these services, but it's not an absurd amount um, when you're dealing with the broader range of watch servicing costs. Now, as watches start to get more expensive, usually I'll start to be more proactive rather than reactive. But when you're dealing with watches, say under $1,000, I tend to be a little bit more reactive. I don't necessarily, you know, I'm trying to be proactive about sending something back to the manufacturer. Oh, it's five years, everything's checking out. Uh, I'm still concerned though, because they said five years. I think you don't need to be so rigid to those estimated frames of time. Test out the watch. How is it running on accuracy? Maybe get a time graph or see if there's any beat air, making sure amplitude is in a good place. Like these are the type of things that I think are more important. And in a lot of instances, you can do a lot of trial and error yourself. Sometimes a watch movement just gets magnetized and you can just get a degausser and then uh, you're pretty much all good to go. So it really depends on uh, the circumstance. I tend to be a little bit more reactive when dealing with this general price range. Many of the movements are, whether you're looking at Seiko's movements, uh, ETA movements, uh, these are robust calibers. They're meant to last and you can see them lasting for long periods of time uh, without servicing. So it's up to you on what you feel comfortable with, but do your research in regards to servicing costs. What are those intervals that brands recommend? The other great thing is like when you mentioned like Hamilton and Seiko, they are a larger company and they will just straight up display what their servicing costs are. Uh, I can link to in the description a couple of things like customer service pricing guide for Seiko as well as Swatch Group. You'll see all of their prices for like all the brands. Like 
I like when brands are transparent about this. Both of these organizations are. Like I was just looking at it. I mean, you're talking about for some of the watches, like under $200 for a three hand watch, uh, for an automatic watch. It's not unreasonable at all. Now in the world of ratios to the total value, that's kind of high, but uh, that's gonna be kind of an entry level position for a servicing of a watch. Don't let servicing scare you. Be aware of it. Know that watches are mechanical things and will have issues from time to time. Uh, but these are usually proven movements. So don't let them scare you away and think that your watch is going to, you know, always like break on you. But it is good to understand what you're getting yourself into. Adam from Instagram asks, do you think a leather band needs to match the leather of someone's belt and shoes? Short answer, no, I don't think you need to. But there might be some people that will disagree with me on that. I uh, always get criticized, it seems like, for some of my style in the comments. But, uh, you know, what do I know? Uh, but just my opinion, I don't think so. I will draw a comparison to something like, say, a tie matching the pocket square. That's kind of a frowned upon thing in the world of men's style. So I almost see it sometimes like, that in a way, I don't think it's the same. A lot of other people will say, you always have to match your leathers. I usually match my belt with my shoes. But for me, the strap just feels like a different animal. It's not necessarily the same category for me. Now, I don't think they should clash. I think that's the important thing that I would say. If you're wearing a medium brown shoe with a belt and then you're wearing this like light tan strap that's way more playful, then yeah, that might be a little bit out of place and maybe not be best practice. But for me, I think you just wear what you want. It kind of depends on the context. If you're at like a black tie event or like a gala or something like that, probably not the best idea to whip out the tricolor NATO strap, right? So just know where you're going, figure out kind of what your general protocol is and what your goal is. If you want to match, I don't think it looks weird. I think it actually could look good and tie everything together. It shows the attention to detail, but just don't have things clash if you're just talking about the rules of style. But again, the rules of style kind of all meaningless and don't really equate to actual reality. So do what you want. Next question, do you think watch brands should advertise all their prices? For example, AP and Rolex hide any price over 100K as on request. Patek shows prices on the site up to $500,000 and then it's on request. I understand most people aren't in the market for such a price range, but it would be awesome to know retail prices for heavy hitters instead of speculating or asking a friend of a friend. So I think transparency generally is better, especially with the internet and where people can just find information. If you're not gonna tell them, they'll find it. But I do understand the other side for watch brands. For a while, Patek Philippe wasn't doing any prices online for the most part. So we have come a long way in that regard. But if you're dealing with brands that have very small production you're talking about maybe under a thousand pieces a year. You know, I could get why they might not want to disclose that because prices do change even based on parts. Like say you're building a house and the builder quotes you at a certain dollar amount, but if the price of lumber goes up, then your total amount for your house goes up. So all of these little components and parts, they get all these parts usually from specialized places in many instances. If those go up, that changes the price of the watch when you're dealing with these smaller supplies. Also when the cycle of producing a watch, I mean, you're, you're talking about watches that say over half a million dollars take months, if not a year to produce in some instances, specifically on price and availability of parts. So that might be another reason why brands are doing this. They just don't wanna maybe set up you know, not having proper expectations, prices change. So that's probably why they do it. But I agree that generally, if the watch is in standard production, brands should absolutely just show the prices. I think transparency is better. Francisco from Facebook, longtime Facebook group member here, asks, for me being born in the 60s, I was always exposed to mechanical wristwatches. And then as an engineer, the inner workings of them always attracted me. What brings you to wanting to watch collect for someone that grew up in an era where you had your cellular phone and computers and other electronic devices? So this is kind of an interesting thing. And I, I now I am a millennial, I grew up when you know, watches still to some degree were a needed thing for part of my life, but I also was in high school when the iPhone came out. So I have a different worldview compared to, I, I bet a lot of people watching that maybe remember watches when they were completely needed. And now you're looking at like Gen Z and this whole generation of people that are growing up where even in their say adolescent life, they have something like the Apple Watch right there that they would you know potentially wanna get instead of a mechanical watch. Now, the thing that's been very interesting is, yes, the total output of watches coming out of Switzerland have gone down in the past five to 10 years, but the industry as a whole has really not necessarily changed in terms of size. And at the very high end, it's actually gotten much bigger. Now, I don't think this just comes down to the flex culture. I really don't think it's just that. And of course, people are buying just because they wanna have you know, luxury goods, luxury spending is certainly still growing and that is going to continue to be a thing, but that doesn't tell the whole story to me, at least in my opinion. 
For myself and why I got into watches, I think it's the same way I think a lot of people that are just generally uh, maybe don't have the need for a watch were able to find some connection to them. We live in a world that is very disposable. Everything that we purchase, we throw it away. It's just, you know, it has a, li it has a lifespan and then it's just done with. Watches are one of the very rare things that are built to last in a world that is disposable. I think the history is very cool. The self-expression of what a watch can you know, say about you, how it makes you feel, it's very cool for me. That's why I really fell in love with them. The depth of interesting types of facts you can learn about watches. I mean, I'm learning something new every single day. Very few things can keep me interested for this long. Watches have had the ability to do that the quality and craftsmanship that goes into it, the fashion and style component to it, and also just being part of a group. There are a lot of ways to get involved in a group that uh, nowadays can be very toxic. And not to say that the watch community can't be toxic. We, you know, we can be toxic like with the best of them, but generally on most days, we're a cool group of people. We like to encourage people to you know, get what they want, buy what they love, at least the people I like to associate with. And when you can belong to something, you can feel like you can kind of also express yourself within that. I think that's a cool thing to be a part of. And it's also an aspirational pursuit, uh, at least for myself. I always see watches as something, there's always something to strive for, there's always something to reach for, there's always something to go after, and that's fun. And that's fun, and it's a never ending game and a marathon uh, that I hope to do for the rest of my life. And I think that's what people that are looking at watches can appreciate when they're looking at them, even if they understand the concept that they're totally not needed, because that's the truth, they're not needed. Last question comes from Mark from Facebook asking about traveling with watches. Number one, how many watches do you take or what do you advise? Number two, what watch to wear on the plane and through the airport? Number three, do you pack watches and check in luggage? And four, finally, what preparation do individuals need to do before flying? So in general, I travel a lot. I will travel probably multiple times a month. I am on planes all the time uh, being in this industry. So I have to travel and I've met many of you, honestly, just going through airports. I feel like that's where I meet the most people that follow this channel. In general though, I would say this, this is what I do. Now, most of my trips are between one to three days. It depends on how long you're gonna be going away but I usually try to keep it as lean as possible. I do not like the concept of traveling with a lot of money, a lot of watches, and I try to keep everything very close to me. If I'm gonna be gone for a day, I will just do one watch, of course. If I'm gonna be gone for two days, probably still one watch. Three days, probably still one watch. I will try to get by with just one watch. Uh, there have been harder things done in life, trust me on that. If I'm going for a week or I'm visiting a brand specifically, I will try to bring a watch that I own that is of the brand, just out of respect. But even then, I try to limit as much as possible bringing excess watches with me that just leave me more susceptible to having a bad day. Let's be frank, people do steal things and you become a target at a certain point if anybody knew who I was and they saw you know me around I don't give them any opportunity to do that uh, when it comes to some of the other questions you ask I think in the airport you know it's generally a safer place as long as you keep your watches on you always keep an eye on your bags I don't check any of uh, expect really expensive items outside of camera gear uh, going through you know baggage like that just as asking for trouble I always will have anything expensive like that on me personally maybe sometimes not even in a bag because I really want to keep it tight on my person. But in general, I think you're okay. Uh, a lot of people have expensive things in airports all the time. Just be vigilant and you know look out for yourself. Also, when you're going through security, this is one thing I would always recommend. Don't just put a watch in one of the small little trays like with your like wallet and phone, like put it in a bag so it's not just out in the open. Cause then it just look, you know, one person could just look at it, say you're not over by the you know baggage or they're doing a pat down on you uh, after going through security and you're just not there for a while. Don't leave that available to somebody to just snag and go, cause it'll be gone and you won't have any opportunity to you know, figure out what the hell happened. Have the right things when traveling, get a nice pouch. We have some great ones on our site from Rapport London. I'd recommend, so we can link to those in the description if you are one to uh, delve into that. And then also I would say, even the watches that you don't decide to bring with you, have the right precautions when you do leave. Always have a good protocol for yourself and making sure your watches are secure. Uh, don't let this stress you out. I think this ultimately comes down to making sure the watches that you own don't own you. Don't let it be too much of your net worth so that if you set it on fire, you know, your life doesn't change. That's something I always recommend to people. Don't let financial hardship come with watch uh, collecting. That just 
shouldn't go hand in hand. So just be smart, don't be too concerned, don't let this stress you out. But those are some of the things I do when I travel uh, with watches specifically. But all right guys, that is my video here today, answering some of your questions. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon, really would love to see that if you want us to keep doing these style of videos, uh, that's a great indicator as well. Definitely check out teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer, how we're able to fund videos like this, factory visits, all of that is through our website of selling watches. Brands don't pay us to make videos. We're all self-funded here through the website and selling watches. If you're in the market for a watch, we'd love to have your business. It allows us to keep doing what we're doing here. And I love what I do. So really would appreciate that. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.